okay. Um, yeah. I mean, yeah, we could wait a couple of minutes. The participants are still increasing, but I think they can arrive slowly. Uh, it's a great pleasure to have you today, Connor Mooney from UC Irvine. And you'll be talking about the Bernstein problem for equations um, of minimal surface type. Take it away, Connor. Great, thank you for the introduction, Almut. And uh, I'd also like to thank the organizers. It's a real uh, pleasure and an honor to speak in this symposium, uh, which is in honor of Alessio, who not only had a tremendous impact on his field, but also on me personally as a mathematician. So thanks, Alessio. <clears throat> so today I'll discuss this, uh, the Bernstein problem. And one of the reasons I wanted to talk about this topic is that I, I think that it motivated some of the most important contributions to geometric analysis and nonlinear elliptic PDEs in the past century. And this is a field in which Alessio has made some important contributions in the last 10 years. And uh, <clears throat> sorry, just a sec. And part of what I'll talk about today, or one of the results, is a joint work with my student Yang from UC Irvine. So to begin with, I'd like to just recall a striking theorem of Bernstein from 1915, which says the following. It says if you have a function on all of R2, and it solves this uh, nonlinear second order elliptic PDE, the divergence of gradient over square to one plus gradient squared is equal to zero, then this function has to be a linear function. And what this PDE says is that the graph of U in R3 is a minimal surface. So the sum of the principal curvatures at every point vanishes. And uh, another way of understanding what this theorem says is that if you have, say, any minimal surface in R3, and you write it as a graph over its tangent plane at some point, then if you pick the point where the surface has non-zero curvature, so it bends up some direction and bends down another, then eventually it has to become vertical. It's because if it didn't, it would be a global graph, and therefore it'd have to be a, a plane. So this is quite a powerful theorem. And one of the reasons I find it surprising is that I like to think of the minimal surface equation as a nonlinear geometric version of the Laplace equation, because it says that say the sum of principal curvatures equals zero is sort of a geometric analog of a sum of second derivatives of a function being zero. On the other hand, we know that there are many, many say, global harmonic functions. Uh, for example, you could take the real part of e to the e to the e to the z, which has very, very fast growth at infinity. <clears throat> and so this is a situation where the nonlinearity in the PDE really helps you get rigidity. For harmonic functions to get a rigidity theorem, you need to impose some growth conditions. And the, the Bernstein problem asks whether this same result holds in higher dimensions. So do all global solutions to the minimal surface equation satisfy this property that they're linear functions? All right. <clears throat> So this problem was completely solved between uh, Bernstein's proof in the case of two dimensions in 1915 and uh, about 1970. And I'd like to spend a little time reviewing the steps of the solution. So first, Bernstein proved it in two dimensions. And uh, his argument is highly non-trivial. And I think it's worth spending time, a little bit of time remembering what he did. There are some simple proofs these days, but his was uh, particularly beautiful. So his proof was based on a topological argument. It says that if you have any saddle-shaped function on R2, so for example, let's say a determinant d squared w is less than zero, then any tangent plane to the graph splits the graph into at least four disconnected components which should go off to infinity. And this is uh, say just a maximum principle. But for example, you could think of that if these blue curves are the nodal set of a saddle-shaped function, then there's no way that they should meet up again somewhere. Otherwise, W would have uh, a local maximum. And at that point, it couldn't be a saddle shape. And so this uh, observation 
has been used actually quite a lot in the classical study of two-dimensional elliptic equations. And Bernstein used it to show that any solution to an elliptic equation in R2, not necessarily uniformly elliptic, uh, which has, so we would say which is bounded or more generally has sublinear growth, has to be a constant function. We just use some topology argument to show this. Uh, so far in the argument, the, the minimal surface equation didn't make any appearance. This was just uh, it's a general elliptic PDE. And then what Bernstein did was he applied this result to this special function. So if you have a minimal graph over R2, then it turns out that the inverse tangent of any directional derivative is uh, solve some elliptic equation. It's a saddle-shaped function. And in my opinion, this is not at all obvious, but the easiest way to see it is that uh, the Gauss map of a minimal surface in R3, so the map that takes a point on the surface to the unit normal on the sphere, is a conformal map uh, because the principal curvatures have the same size and opposite sign. And so the inverse tangent of a directional derivative uh, can be viewed as the phase of some uh, holomorphic map after you make an appropriate stereographic projection. And so in particular, this uh, function is harmonic on the graph of U. So it's a saddle function and in addition, it's bounded. And so Bernstein could conclude that it's constant and uh, any function, all of whose directional derivatives are constants has to be a linear function. This uh, I think is a, quite a challenging proof and if one attempts to generalize these topological arguments to higher dimensions, one immediately runs into trouble. So to extend this theorem to higher dimensions, some new ideas were needed. And it wasn't until Fleming came up with a new idea in 1962 that the problem really seemed accessible. And Fleming's idea was based on uh, the monotonicity formula, which roughly speaking says that if you have a minimal surface, uh, an arbitrary co-dimension and an arbitrary dimension, then at either very small or very large scales, it has a cone structure. And using this monotonicity formula, Burns, or Fleming could conclude that if there was any non-trivial, say non-linear global solution to the minimal surface equation, then there would have to be uh, a non-trivial area minimizing hypercone in Rn plus one. And this basically comes from if you have a graph of a solution, say a minimal graph in R over Rn, and you zoom out and zoom out and zoom out, then these graphs converge to uh, a minimal cone in Rn plus one after taking an appropriate subsequence. And uh, <clears throat> this gave a new proof pretty much immediately for two dimensional graphs in R3 because the only uh, minimal cones in R3 should be flat. If you have a cone in R3, then there's only one non-zero curvature. And uh, because the sum of curvatures is equal to zero, this should be a flat object. So this is a, a nice new approach to Bernstein's result. And what was nice about it is it immediately opened the door to higher dimensions. And it just reduced the problem to uh, whether, say, uh, determining whether or not area minimizing hypercones exist in Rn plus one. So the next improvement was made by DeGiorgi three years later, and he showed that this cone K has to have a special structure, should be invariant under translations in the vertical direction. So uh, in, in essence, he gained a dimension. So what these cones have to look like would be just an area minimizing cone in Rn cross R. And so Bern, or, uh, DeGiorgi improved uh, the result of Fleming and Bernstein to 3D. So 3D uh, minimal surfaces in R4. And then uh, finally, shortly thereafter, Almgren and Simons improved up to dimension seven. And they did this by showing that all the area minimizing hypercones in those low dimensions have to be flat. And in fact, they didn't need area minimizing. They just needed that these cones are 
say, minimizing under tiny perturbations, which is stable. And we use the stability inequality. And finally, in a remarkable paper of 1969, just one year after Simons, Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti constructed an example of a nonlinear global solution to the minimal surface equation in R8. And I'll talk a little bit more about this later, but I read not long ago in a survey paper that Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti, they solved this problem in a matter of three days. I guess they got together and just thought nonstop about it until they cracked it. I thought this was kind of amazing. I guess there was really a sense of urgency to finish off the problem at that point. <clears throat> okay. So this solved the original Bernstein problem. But uh, there are just a few more say, natural questions that one could ask. And now that one knows that there exists these nonlinear global uh, solutions to the minimal surface equation, one could ask if there are additional conditions, the growth hypotheses, uh, under which the Bernstein property would hold. And there are a few natural examples of such conditions. So the first is, if the gradient of the solution is globally bounded, then the solution has to be a linear function. And this was uh, a consequence of the, uh, the famous theorem of De Georgi and Nash from 1958. So the, the point is that the equation becomes uniformly elliptic under this gradient bound. And so this very hard theorem of Georgi and Nash can be applied in a Harnack inequality. Uh, the second condition is that you can basically integrate this condition and it still works. So if U has linear growth, then uh, it's a linear function. And this is actually a consequence of uh, a challenging interior gradient estimate of Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Miranda from 1969, uh, which, basically, which just says that if U has linear growth, then one can conclude that the gradient is globally bounded. And that result is extremely useful in its own right, and it has uh, plays an important role, for example, in the theory of the Dirichlet problem for the minimal surface equation, and also in the construction of Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti. So that was a very... Uh, a central result in nonlinear elliptic equations. And finally, the, the best result I know to date is due to Ecker and Heusken in 1990, which is that if you have a global solution whose gradient grows sublinearly, then the solution is linear. And this, it seems, is basically optimal. There are some uh, examples of Leon Simon of global solutions to the minimal surface equation which in very high dimensions grow basically super quadratic, or sorry, barely super quadratic. So there's not hope at improving uh, this result of Ecker and Heusken very much. Uh, on the other hand, I think that there's still a lot we have to discover about solutions, say global solutions to the minimal surface equation, uh, because there aren't many examples we have of these global solutions. And, don't have a very systematic way of constructing them. And two of my favorite open problems are, for example, uh, one could ask if all global solutions of the minimal surface equation grow polynomially at infinity. This is a beautiful question that I saw in a paper of, I think, uh, Bombieri and Giusti from uh, early 1970s. And all the examples we have have polynomial growth. Uh, for example, the Bombieri de Giorgi Giusti, solution grows cubically at infinity. And so um, it's pretty natural to ask this question, I think, but it seems quite challenging. Seems like any, uh, say, uh, hopeful approach to this problem would have to use something about the tangent cone at infinity. But if you don't know something about the uniqueness of this tangent cone, it's very difficult to say something quantitative. And another uh, beautiful question is, does there exist a nonlinear polynomial that solves the, the minimal surface equation? For example, I don't know, in a million dimensions. And this has a much more algebraic nature. Okay. <clears throat> so uh, at this point, I'm gonna switch directions a little bit and say that to approach challenging questions like this, it's sometimes useful to consider a slightly more general problem. 
And I think a natural generalization of a minimal surface would be a minimizer of a so-called parametric elliptic functional. So now the object of interest for us is a hypersurface in Rn plus one, which minimizes the sort of weighted area where the area element is weighted by a function which depends on the direction of the tangent plane to the surface and the direction of the unit normal, sorry. And uh, <clears throat> it turns out that for this to be a natural generalization of the minimal surface uh, problem, let's say it has a nice existence and regularity theory, the right conditions to impose on the integrand phi are that it's one homogeneous on Rn plus one, uh, positive on the sphere, and it's convex. So it's, it's uh, sublevel sets are uniformly convex sets. I think that the easiest way to see that this is the correct condition to impose on the integrand phi uh, is to look at the first variation of the function. So if you look at the first variation, you see that it's uh, phi ij at the unit normal nu times so two is the second fundamental form of the surface, ij is zero. So for example, in the case that phi is just the one on the sphere, so you get the area functional, this is the sum of principal curvatures is zero, it's the minimal surface equation. And in general, these uh, ellipticity conditions imply that the eigenvalues of this matrix phi ij are between positive constants. So it says that this uh, minimizing hypersurface has some sort of balancing of principal curvatures. Okay, uh, but before going on, I also want to emphasize that these functionals are not only interesting from a theoretical point of view, and that it's a natural generalization of minimal surface. You could one could think this is like Hilbert's problem asked to study minimizers of f of gradient u which are sort of nonlinear versions of Laplace. This is sort of the same thing in a geometric setting. Uh, but also these functionals arise uh, in physics and in geometry very naturally. So for example, if you study crystal surfaces, which tend to form facets, uh, the faces tend to favor certain directions more than others. And it's very natural to model them by functionals of this type. And uh, these types of functionals also arise in Finsler geometry study minimal uh, immersions in a Finsler manifold. So the interest in them is not merely academic. And uh, the problem that we're going to discuss for the rest of the talk is the Bernstein problem associated to these more general functionals. So if a minimizer is the graph of a function over all of Rn, is this uh, minimizer necessarily a hyper? Before we discuss what's known, let me just recast the problem briefly in PDE language for those of you who are more comfortable with that, like me. So if we write sigma as the graph of a function u, then one can rewrite this Euler-Lagrange equation, phi ij times 2ij is equal to zero, as this quasi-linear elliptic PDE for u, where the coefficients are the second derivative, the Hessian of uh, function little phi, which is just the integrand capital phi restricted to uh, the tangent plane to the north pole of the sphere. You can see that this function little phi is asymptotically one homogeneous. And so some of its second derivatives become much smaller than others at infinity and the ellipticity degenerates as the gradient gets large in a way that uh, mimics what happens for the minimal surface equation. And uh, <clears throat> I gave a short derivation of this, but the interest of time, I think I'll just uh, move on. I think the important thing is just that uh, you solve some elliptic equation with a very similar structure to the minimal surface equation. Okay, so one surprisingly, this problem is well studied. And uh, what's known is on this slide. So the first positive result was proven in two dimensions, unsurprisingly by Jenkins in 61. So he proved that global solutions to these equations of minimal surface type are linear functions. And his proof was based on the fact that the Gauss map of uh, a minimizer in three dimensions, so a two-dimensional surface in 3D that minimizes 
a parametric elliptic functional, the Gauss map is a quasi-conformal map into this sphere. And we have nice say, rigidity results for global uh, bounded quasi-conformal maps that have constants. This was a, a proof based on complex analysis, basically. But I think that uh, something that's more surprising is that this result, so I think when I, I hear something holds in two dimensions, I tend not to be too surprised because 2D is extremely rigid, either topologically or energetically. But in three dimensions, it turns out that the Bernstein property holds for these equations of minimal surface type. This was proved by Leon Simon in 1977. And unsurprisingly, the proof is pretty heavy duty. So he relies on a sophisticated regularity theorem due to Almgren, Shane, and himself for minimizers of the parametric problem, which says that uh, basically the n minus two dimensional measure of the singular set of a minimizer vanishes. And uh, Leon also proved that the uh, Bernstein property holds up to this magic dimension seven if the functional is close enough to the area functional in the appropriate sense. So if the integral, or so the uh, integrand is close to the area integrand in uh, C21. And then the last thing one could ask is, uh, if you impose some growth hypotheses, do you also get the Bernstein theorem for these equations of minimal surface type? And the answer is yes, if the gradient is bounded, again, by the de georgie nash theorem, or if uh, the solution has linear growth, then there's also an interior gradient estimate of Leon Simon, which applies. So what these results together left open was what happens between dimensions four and seven? I think this is a very natural question is if one could ask, is the minimal surface equation just one special example of uh, a member of a family of natural equations, these equations of minimal surface type, for which the Bernstein property holds up to dimension seven, or is the isotropy of the area functional extremely important? If you relax that, can you build these global solutions in smaller dimensions? And the main theorem uh, I'd like to discuss today says that indeed, when you remove this isotropy, this magic dimension decreases. So the theorem says that there exists a quadratic polynomial on R6. It's in fact a harmonic polynomial. And uh, it's not only harmonic, but it solves a, an equation of minimal surface type. So the graph minimizes uh, uniformly elliptic functional or parametric elliptic functional. So just uh, a few remarks. First is that uh, it's sort of, it answers the question whether or not polynomials can solve equations of this type, which I thought was kind of interesting. And the second remark is that this integrand phi uh, has to be, or the functional has to be far from the area functional. And this is because of Leon's result. If phi were very close to one in an appropriate sense, then the existence of such examples is ruled out by his theorem. And as we'll see, the, the level sets of the integrand are somewhat box-shaped. And the third remark will be that it's natural to ask, okay, if you can do this in R6, why not push all the way down to R4, which is the smallest dimension allowed by the results we know? And the answer is kind of interesting. Uh, okay, we don't know the answer yet. Let's say that if you try the same polynomial or the analogous polynomial in R4, it turns out not to work. On the other hand, I uh, have reasons to believe that there exist global solutions to equations of minimal surface type and that minimal dimension n equals four, but it still uh, remains open as of this moment. And for the rest of the talk, I'd like to uh, describe the idea of the proof of this theorem and why I expect one should be able to construct examples in four dimensions. Okay, so before jumping into the proof of the theorem, I think it's worth recalling what Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti did for the area functional case. So for the minimal surface case, remember that the problem uh, 
was reduced to the existence or one needs the existence of a non-trivial area minimizing cone in whichever dimension in which you want to construct a solution. And the very natural cone for them to look at was this symmetric cone uh, x equals y in R8, where x is in R4 and y is in R4. So this is the so-called Simon's cone. And it's easy to see that it's, uh, let's say, uh, minimal because of its symmetry. So it looks the same from both sides. So it has mean curvature zero away from every point, but it's not obvious that it's area minimizing. And the first thing that they did was to show that this cone is area minimizing in R8 by finding a, a smooth perturbation of the cone, which is asymptotic to the cone at infinity and is itself a minimal surface and it lies on one side and its dilations foliate that side. So it's, it's easier to explain with a picture. So if we have schematically R4 and the horizontal axis and R4 and the vertical axis, then the Simon's cone is this X formed by the diagonals. And they managed to find a, a minimal surface that sort of hugs the cone from one side at infinity. And uh, all the dilations are foliating one side of the cone. And this is a very careful ODE analysis that they do to prove the existence of this uh, minimal surface sigma. And in fact, they have some quantitative information, which is important, which says that each leaf in the foliation, if you move out a distance r from the origin, is roughly a distance r to the minus two from the Simon's cone. And this uh, sort of comes from an analysis of the Jacobi operator of the, the Simon's cone, which tells you at least a leading order, which small perturbations are minimal. And what their idea was from this point was to try to build functions whose level sets look like the leaves in this foliation. And one could think that if one of the leaves was the one level set and the Simon's cone was the zero level set, then you're traveling from zero to one over a distance of r to the minus two. That suggests the gradient growth of your example should be quadratic or the growth of the solution itself should be cubic. And this is exactly what they, what they notice is that each of these leaves sigma looks very much like the level surface, the level set of a cubic homogeneous function, R cubed cosine of two theta, where R is distance from origin here and uh, theta is the angle formed by mod Y over mod X. So the problems are now reduced to two dimensions by the symmetries of the Simon's cone. And finally, what they do, which is the truly tricky part, is they build global super and sub solutions to the minimal surface equation, which have cubic growth and look like this function r cubed cosine two theta. In fact, I think that they show that this function r cubed cosine two theta is itself a sub solution to the minimal surface equation where it's positive and the super solution where it's negative. And then they worked very hard to construct a, a super solution in the region where this function is positive, some solution where it's negative. Uh, I guess that, that's what took them two and a half days. And uh, then using the existence of the super and sub solutions, they could solve the Dirichlet problem in larger and larger balls and use these to control the corresponding solution and show that it uh, converges to a nonlinear global solution with cubic growth over R8. So this theorem, uh, see what goes into this, uh, I think a lot goes into this. This is quite heavy duty. It's a careful ODE analysis in producing the foliation. Uh, constructing the super and sub solutions is quite delicate. And then one needs the solvability of the Dirichlet problem and also the interior gradient estimate to show convergence to a non-trivial global solution in the argument. Right, before I move on to say the more general parametric elliptic case, I think a natural question is, well, if you try this approach in lower dimensions, so for example, in R6, R3 cross R3, what goes wrong? Well, you can look for these minimal surfaces, which are asymptotic to the analog of the Simon's cone, mod X is equal to mod Y. 
But what happens is that they begin to oscillate around the cone. And so the dilations of these surfaces, they self-intersect. And this reflects the fact that these cones are not area minimizing. In fact, they're not stable in lower dimensions. Okay. So now I'm gonna go to the approach towards constructing the six dimensional example of a solution to an equation of minimal surface type, which philosophically is much different and uses much less. So when you want to let's say build uh, these sort of counter examples to a class of equations, the game is a little bit different. You typically start by fixing a natural candidate for a solution, and then you go backwards and you build the equation itself. We build the integrand phi of our functional. When you do this, the problem really loses its elliptic nature and it becomes hyperbolic for a reason I'll be more precise about now. So the equation you'll recall is uh, little phi ij at gradient u times uij summing over i and j is equal to zero. Uh, with this function, little phi was the function capital phi restricted to a hyperplane. And if we were write this equation in terms of the Legendre transform of u, then it becomes a linear equation for phi. So it becomes a, the inverse Hessian of Legendre transform of u, take the trace of that with Hessian of phi, and that equals zero everywhere. And this is not only a linear equation, but it's going to be a linear hyperbolic equation because any natural choice of a candidate for a, say a global solution to an equation of minimal surface type will be a saddle shaped. So its Hessian will have non-zero signature, uh, positive and negative eigenvalues. And so now the game is to solve this linear hyperbolic equation for the integrand phi. And one could think philosophically as follows, that you're, you're fixing this some crystal surface given by the graph of a function u, and you send all these waves through it by solving the Cauchy problem. And in doing so, you can build all the functionals for which the graph of u is a critical point. But what you're interested in is finding an example of such a functional that satisfies the correct convexity conditions. And that's the tricky part. So from this point, we can start to be a little bit more precise and maybe motivated by what Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti did. It's a work in even dimensions, R2k, with coordinates x and y in Rk. And we'll just take u to be the simplest possible saddle-shaped uh, quadratic polynomial, mod x squared minus mod y squared. And it shares the symmetries of the analog of the Simons cone in that dimension. And we can also choose our uh, function small phi to share the symmetries of the Simons cone, so invariant under rotations in x and y. And when we do this, the equation becomes basically the wave equation for phi with a lower order term. So it becomes the wave operator on psi plus uh, k minus one times, <clears throat> times uh, the gradient of psi dot one over s minus one over t, where x, uh, so s is mod x and t is mod y. And so this is sort of a singular lower order term. And when I saw this, I was very happy because this is quite a classical equation. It's very well studied. In fact, there's an explicit representation formulae for solutions in terms of certain hypergeometric functions. The problem is that in most cases, I, I have a very hard time understanding the qualitative properties of the solutions to the Cauchy problem for this equation uh, because I don't understand very well what's happening with the solutions with these hypergeometric functions. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, it turns out that when k is equal to three, so that when we're working in R6, a miracle happens. And this equation can be written as the wave operator. The equation reduces to the wave operator on s times t times the function psi is equal to zero. And so we have just an extremely explicit representation formula, this classical D'Alembert formula uh, given by the sum of two waves traveling with speed one in opposite directions. And uh, the game at this point is just to choose the shapes of these traveling waves so that the corresponding integrand that you've constructed is 
uniformly elliptic, satisfies the right convexity properties. And that's the tricky part here. So we haven't used any, um, let's say, sophisticated theory. It's just uh, tricky to try to find a shape f and g that will work to make the integrand phi uniformly elliptic. And I won't say too much about that because of timing, but I will say that it's natural to choose these shapes or this function f and g to be asymptotically homogeneous of degree three, because then this function psi will be asymptotically homogeneous of degree one. It's like three homogeneous in the numerator and two homogeneous in denominator. And it turns out there, there are many choices one can make, uh, but there's one particularly simple choice which leads to this integrand, which has a fairly simple algebraic form. You can see this, this three homogeneous function in the integrand, two homogeneous in the denominator. And it's not so important what it is so much as that it's fairly simple to write down. The point I wanna make is about the geometry of the integrand phi, which is the shape of its sublevel sets are sort of like boxes. So if you look at the set where the integrand phi is equal to one, at least uh, the slice of that sublevel set and x7 is equal to zero hyperplane, it's fairly box shaped and that's very natural from a variational point of view for the following reason. And if you look at the graph of the function u, and overwhelmingly its unit normals point in the direction of the Simons cone. And so energetically, we'd like the values of the integrand to be smaller in those directions than in the coordinate directions. And so indeed, it's natural for these sublevels that's to be box shaped so that the integrand phi grows a little bit slower in the diagonal directions than in the coordinate directions. So that's, I think, uh, agrees with intuition. Now a few remarks about the construction that are going on. There are first many, many choices of integrand phi that'll work that one could attain by perturbing the shapes of the traveling waves. <clears throat> and uh, I think this is something I'd like to emphasize. Typically in these examples, there's not just one special integrand that's gonna work. There's some family or some neighborhood of uh, an example you've constructed will do the job. If you have some flexibility. But I think maybe a more important observation is the next one, which is that the, the level sets of this quadratic polynomial U are all minimizers of the same parametric elliptic functional whose integrand is the integrand phi we constructed restricted to the x7 is equal to zero hyperplane. And this is just a consequence of the homogeneity of the function u. So the, the invariance of the equation it solves under Lipschitz rescalings combined with its homogeneity tells you that any multiple of this quadratic polynomial solves the same equation. And basically, if you take multiples of u and you slide them up and down uh, in the appropriate way, you can do this in a way so that the, the graphs converge to the cylinders over a level set. I think that's the easiest way to see that each of the level surfaces uh, minimizes a phi naught. And the reason I want to bring this up is that that's the most direct way, in my opinion, to see that the analogous quadratic polynomial in R4 doesn't do the job. So if you look at one half mod x squared minus mod y squared in R4, or x and y in R2, <clears throat> uh, we know that all the level sets of this quadratic polynomial would have to minimize some parametric elliptic functional. And the nice thing about this is that it reduces the question of whether or not this could solve some equation of minimal surface type to an ODE problem. So you look at this level surface, u is equal to one, and you perform some ODE analysis. And what you find is that whichever integrand you construct so that this uh, hypersurface sigma x squared is, uh, minus y squared is equal to one is minimizing would have to have uh, second derivatives which blow up on the Simons cone. So there's no way that this quadratic polynomial works. On the other hand, it is known 
that the Simons cone in R4 mod x mod e equals mod y minimizes a uniformly elliptic functional. It's just that uh, one side of it can't be foliated by leaves given by the level set of this quadratic polynomial. And this is a very interesting theorem of Frank Morgan around 1990. And he proved this uh, using a very delicate calibration. The technique is where you build a divergence-free vector field which satisfies certain um, delicate inequalities related to the integrand phi. But I think that this gives hope, Frank Morgan's theorem gives hope that there exists some solution to uh, an equation of minimal surface type in four dimensions. And the, what I'd like to talk about now is some current work, which is joint with Yang, which I think gives a hopeful approach at the Bernstein problem for equations of minimal versus surface type in 4D by combining the two previous techniques that I mentioned. So the first step, uh, remembering what Bombieri, De Giorgi, and Giusti did, would be to look for a foliation proof of Frank Morgan's result. And it turns out that one can do this. So we showed that there do in fact exist analytic elliptic integrants on R4, such that each side of this cone in R4 is foliated by uh, hypersurfaces which minimize these uh, parametric elliptic functionals. And furthermore, for any choice of parameter gamma between one and three halves, one can choose the integrand so that these hypersurfaces look very much like the level sets of the function r to the gamma cosine two theta. So they look like level sets of functions which are homogeneous of degree between one and three halves. And what this suggests is that we now say switch to the hyperbolic game, fix an entire function which is asymptotically homogeneous of some degree between one and three halves and uh, try to solve the corresponding hyperbolic equation to produce an integrand with the correct convexity properties. And uh, it's not clear to me exactly uh, how cleanly this works yet, but I will say that the particular choice of homogeneity four thirds looks very inviting. And the only reason I say that is that if you make a simple choice of function u like x to the four thirds minus y to the four thirds, then the corresponding hyperbolic equation has a really clean representation formula given in terms of traveling waves like before. And so from, from that point, I, I think that this problem begins to look tractable. And hopefully we manage to, to crack it soon. And finally, in the last couple of minutes, let me just say some other current work or some questions we're thinking about will be, uh, say, to think about some conditions under which one can recover the Bernstein result. So for example, one could ask if the gradient grows slowly enough, so the gradient is bounded, we have the Bernstein theorem, but if it grows like x to the power to epsilon or epsilon is small, depending on dimension and the integrand, uh, are the solutions necessarily linear functions? And the last question, which I think is sort of interesting is that in this example that I constructed, the integrand is uh, C21, but not C3 outside of the origin. And the natural question is, can you make it smooth or even analytic outside the origin? And uh, I think the answer is yes, because of the flexibility and the shapes of these traveling waves that one can construct, but it could be uh, good to check. And with that, I would like to finish the talk and thank you all for your attention and uh, thank Alessio for uh, his mentorship when I was a postdoc and for winning the Fields Medal so I could be here today. Thank you so much, Connor. Uh, for, uh, uh, let's please let's have some questions. Any questions from the audience? I have a question. Go ahead. So, um, so the the Bernstein uh, the 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 solution of the Bernstein problem for the for the minimal. So, um, surface equations graphs for graphs 
uh, you told us the story, and it goes through through the theory of 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 minimal surfaces which are not graphs, right? Uh, because you you the only proof up to dimension seven, say you need to to classify cones, correct? Yes, yes, that's true. Have you ever seen a proof? <laughs> Um, I guess not, but <laughs> I just want to know. Do you think it could exist a proof that just uses the, I mean, you would like to, to just stay with graphs and look at the, it's a PDE and, and just try to, to, to prove, uh, to prove that uh, a Bernstein, a Bernstein soluble theorem, say, without having to go through cones and uh, more complicated, well, cones have a simplicity on the other hand. Right. Yeah, so a proof that doesn't use a monotonicity formula would be- In amazing. particular, in particular. Yeah, the only, the only thing I know of is this proof of Leon Simon uh, of the Bernstein theorem for these minimal surface equations in 3D. Mm -hmm. And so that proof works for the parametric elliptic functionals. So it avoids the, the monotonicity formula as a tool. Um, but apart from this, so I think what he's relying on is, he still relies on the parametric theory though. I think about it, he relies on this regularity theorem, which says that minimizers of the parametric elliptic functionals have singular sets with vanishing n minus two dimensional measure. So yeah, I'm, uh, I haven't seen anything like this. I really love to see a proof as well, which avoided passing through the um, theory of non-graphical minimizers. I think the starting point would be something like what Leon did. But do you think that that could be possible. Or... <laughs> <laughs> you know, I I have my doubts. I, my mm -hmm. my feeling is that the at least for this magical dimension seven, that's just so closely tied to the um, the analysis of minimal cones and area minimizing cones in low dimensions. I, yeah, but I, you see now in in these other in this work I presented with Alessio, Xavier, and Joaquim. Uh, uh -huh. the, the dimension, like a, a particular dimension also comes in without, uh, just for a PD, for a simple PD, you see. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Yes, you're right, maybe there's hope. So, yeah, I'll, I'll think about it. Any other questions? Any comments? Maybe, can I? Please. Yeah, so maybe a, first a question about your approach, um, which, so it looks very much related to even dimension, right? So every time you have the product, so you say, well, let me try with six, and then now I try with four. Well, you, you uh, can also work in odd dimension. You can work with these lost in cones, for example, in R5. Yes. And the same approach does the job. Right, so I was wondering, because you, you did six and then you jumped directly to four. I was wondering mm -hmm. whether you didn't try the five first. I mean, you just felt that four was the You're big right. jet cobot and then... Yeah. I tried five. It's uh, So thanks for asking this question. I forgot to mention. If you try this in five dimensions, then uh, one still runs into the same problem that the level surfaces of quadratic polynomials don't solve uniformly elliptic functionals. Uh, or the analysis. But then your recent result with Yang uh, will probably work, right? Also in dimension five, like the existing some foliation. Yes, so that, that would work also in, uh, in higher dimensions. So I think in general, the, uh, the, the leaves of the foliation have an approach rate that, look, that corresponds to level sets of functions homogeneous of degree between one and n minus one over two. Between, okay. Yeah. So in 4D, it's one okay. and three half. Four, three half yeah. With a little the bit, two. six is the first time you hit the two. Yeah. I was also curious when you say the X to the four third minus Y to the four third, right? That's like, is that like the infinite harmonic function? <laughs> <Yeah. too? laughs> 
That'd be an example. It's infinity harmonic and solve a solution. So. Uh, yeah, it just looks into it. And uh, I would also, uh, I mean, this is more a comment. There's no need to with the mark, right? You say these three days. I mean, I remember a bit the story vaguely, but I don't know where you, where, where do you find the three days? Because I remember the story that they started the proof, like the Bulgaria, the George Justi. And oh. I think what they did very quickly was to find the minimality of Simon's cones. Okay. That's for sure. But then I'm not sure the build that counter example, the really the the you know the solution to the best and problem with the level sets so some super solutions i think that one took a bit longer i think what they really, well, that, the would part really what? That, would, that would not surprise me if it took longer <laughs> right so i think what they did super quick was the minimum i mean like two three days right i think that there was a, a survey paper written by jenny harrison uh, mm. where i saw this story the, the Bernstein problem was that often three days, but uh, I don't think it said much more than just uh, one sentence. I think what the, what they started at four a.m. playing bridge, and then they moved to solving the problem, you know, and going on all day. <laughs> like what I know from from Bombieri. But then I think the idea came. I, mean, I know that I think the George at some moment was hiking in the mountains, and then he called from some, you know lost location in somewhere in Italy and called uh, Justin Bombieri in the office with some other idea that he had. So I think that they are this, the two events didn't take place exactly at the same time. So we didn't amount maybe, but no, I'm not sure about the three the days. The of the cone and the construction of the graph. I think it took two slices, yeah, but which Bombieri is reassuring, right? I mean, is it? <laughs> Bombieri told me that one night they finished like at three, a.m. or 4 a.m. working and then uh, and the Georgie said okay I wait for you tomorrow at the school at, at, at seven. 7 in the morning <laughs> yeah I think that's when they started that's and when they started Bieri, the Bieri was in the beginning when Bieri was late and when he, he arrived to the school the Georgie was waiting uh, on the door <laughs> there <laughs> <on the> stairs <laughs> <laughs> You are late, come on. You just left one hour. What, what did you do? <laughs> yeah, probably that was the beginning and, and, and Justy was not there. Was not there. It was just right. He arrived uh, slightly later, I think. This yes. <laughs> I'll have to remember these details. Thanks, uh, uh, Connor. Can I, can I ask still a question? Or? Sure. Yeah. We have lots of time, actually. We have, uh, so we are officially have another five or six minutes to finish. And I don't think they will cut us off. I think we have done on our, let's do one thing. Let's uh, thank the speakers once more, all three sure. of them for wonderful talks. And then we'll just stay and talk. How about that? <laughs> so thank you.